and turn in your Bible to John chapter 5. I'm going to do a little sermon today on uh, go and sin no more. John chapter 5 and verse 14. Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Uh, what was Jesus meaning by that? Go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Beginning in verse 1. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. In other words, they're going to accuse him because if Jesus says, okay, yeah, go ahead and kill her, everybody's going to say, wow, that's not very nice. And if Jesus doesn't say it, well, then he's contradicting the law of Moses. But there's a problem because, see, the law of Moses said both get put to death, not just the woman. Where's the man? Jesus saw their little trap. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Do, do, do. <laughs> So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Jesus is not saying, I'm okay with the adultery that she committed. I'm okay with her sin. All right? That's not what he's saying. He's saying, you people are a bunch of hypocrites and you didn't even follow the scriptures. Where's the man at? You know? And I don't know what Jesus wrote on the ground there, but he could have said, wrote in you know, Hebrew or whatever there, where's the man? Verse 8, And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. And you know, it's so funny, because hypocrites will use this passage and they'll say, Let him that's without stone, you know, sin cast the first stone. You catch him in some kind of wicked, vile thing, and they say, Well, if you're without sin, then you can cast a stone. <laughs> oh, that's not what the passage is saying. Jesus is pointing out their hypocritical judgment. Okay, he wasn't saying that adultery is fine. Verse 10, When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more? I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. Hmm. Why would Jesus say that to a woman that was obviously a sinner? Um, is it possible that Jesus was saying to her that you should go and live a sinlessly perfect life before he even dies on the cross? What's Jesus saying to her? That's what we're going to look about in this study here today. Um, there are certain things that will bring you into God's judgment, before God's judgment. And those things that you know are wrong, those things that you know are self-destructive, you need to quit doing those things. Well, then that means that you're sinlessly perfect, not on your life. Uh, Christians will struggle with sin for the rest of their life. But I'm going to tell you right now, there are certain things the Lord wants you to quit, and He will help you to quit. And if you don't quit, He's going to chasten you harshly. You say, well, that's... that's in the Gospels, that's, you know, dispensationally. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You are to consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6. So be careful when you have people messing around with, uh, you know, using dispensationalism to get away from everything that Jesus ever said. Got to be real careful about that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 33 through 34. We call them hyper-dispensationalists, by the way. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. 
So you can't say to me, well, Jesus said, go and sin no more, but Paul never said, Paul said, sin not. Again, what's he talking about here? Is he really truly saying that you can live a sinlessly perfect life? Like the Church of the Nazarene, they, I think they teach that, the, the second work of grace that happens after you get saved. Um, you're no longer a sinner and things like this. Uh, that's nonsense. And people try to put that on me. They say, you know, I, I've heard the thing, accusations of me teaching lordship salvation or whatever else. There's no such thing as lordship salvation. It's a, it's a figment of people's imagination, okay? The, where's, the, where's the term lordship salvation in there? It's not there. It's something that, that people have created and they can say, so-and-so teaches lordship salvation. This person teaches. No, this one does. No, this. Where's it at in the scriptures? Where's this thing defined at? It's not there. So you can basically make it, you can put it on anybody and say oh, it fits them. Uh, no, it doesn't fit anyone because it's not a biblical thing. But what's going on here? Sin not. Go and sin no more. What's happening there? 1 John chapter 1. First John chapter 1. Verses 5 through 10 it says, oops, I'm on 2 John. I'll get to the right John here in a minute. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. People that teach sinless perfection are violating verses 8 and 10 there. I have no sin in my life. It's not what the Bible says. But you see, the relationship between you and God changes when you get saved. You come to Him as a sinner, right? You're coming there and you're saying, I'm guilty of a lot of really wicked things. Would you please save me? All right? God will save you. You don't become sinlessly perfect at that point in time. But there are certain things that God is going to expect you to give up. And He's going to say, okay... I'm going to help you get through that stuff. I used to be addicted to pornography. I'm not anymore. Many, many, many years of being totally free from it. No desire to go back to it. Uh, from a, a point of view, well, then it was just, it was overpowering at times back when I was addicted to it. All right. Uh, video game addiction. No desire to play video games anymore. And again, from some guy that used to play them just a lot, a whole lot. All right. And there's plenty of other things that I could go over in my life that God has cleaned up in my life since I've gotten saved. Why? Because there's been a spiritual rebirth there. It's not of the will of the flesh. All right? I didn't get saved and say, okay, now I'm going to do some really neat stuff here and whatever else. I tried giving stuff up, giving up a lot of wickedness before I got saved because I was a professing false Christian back then. All right? I mean, well, I shouldn't say a professing false Christian. That's kind of a double negative thing there. I was a professing Christian, but I was false. <laughs> okay, say it that way. I tried to give up stuff. I tried to live good and holy and righteous and pure and whatever else. I tried to do things of my own will, you see. But I got saved, and then the Lord said, Okay, now I'm going to help you. Because the Holy Spirit is now in your life. Now I can start to come in there, and I can convict you of those sins to the point where I can you know, help you get out of that stuff. That's true salvation. So when the Lord's saying, go and sin no more, and Paul says, sin not, what he's saying is, those things that you know are wrong and that you're struggling with, you need to get that stuff cleaned up. You need to quit doing it. And I mean, you know, again, why would people fight this? It's so interesting to me that you have professing Christians and they fight against this thing of saying, you need to turn from sin, repent of sin. Why would you fight against that? You know, some guy's got his, his hand caught in a, in a chipper shredder and it's pulling him in. It's, it's cut more and more of his hand off. And I say, stop doing that. Stop. You need to turn from that. 
don't tell me about it. And he just keeps having his hand just ground off and up into his arm. And you're just going to, you know, why? You say, well, it's not that bad. Sin is negative. <laughs> why don't you want to turn from sin? You know, these people that, you know, there's no turning from sin and there's no repentance of sin or whatever else. We got to eliminate that from our speech and whatever. Why? Why? Let me know what he's saying to you. That, you know, just repent of sin and turn from sin and just forget about what Jesus did on the cross. I have never preached that. No other preacher that I've ever known of that, that teaches repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. No other preacher preaches that. That you can just repent of sin and just turn from sin and, and just forget what Jesus did. 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. My little children, these things write I unto you, unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Okay? So in verse 1, there it says that ye sin not. Um, and then right after it, and if any man sin... Sin not, but if you do sin, you see, you're supposed to clean up your life with the help of the Holy Spirit. That comes after salvation. That has to be there. That's part of salvation. All right? And if you do sin, you mess up, you say, I've given up the addiction over here, but then I went and I was prideful over here. Confess your sins to the Lord. You say, oh, I'm sorry, Lord. You know, uh, I... I coveted that thing and I shouldn't have done that and 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 whatever and and uh, thank you Lord for helping me. I'm not going back to drinking again and I'm not not watching that wicked television again. I'm not doing this again. I'm not doing that again. And I'm so glad because boy, my mind is so much clearer now. I don't have the hangovers anymore. I don't have the whatever. I'm so glad I got rid of that sin, but I'm sure struggling in this area. See? Again, lost people don't want that struggle. They don't want that show you one other place we're going to go to here. Romans chapter 7. I'll show you the uh, crazy life of a Christian. Romans chapter 7 verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, what I, now if I, do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? All right, finish the verse here, or the chapter. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And right then, John comes walking over and says, Paul, you're falling for Lordship Salvation. All this struggling between feeling bad about sin and conviction of sin and, and i got to turn from this. and I, Just don't worry about it, Paul. You've believed, haven't you? Then you're saved. Don't have any conviction of sin. There's no turning from sin, no repentance, no... None, none of that stuff. You're beating yourself up, Paul. You don't have peace, Paul. You should have peace with your sin, Paul. You should be okay with sin. You shouldn't judge other people's sin, Paul. You shouldn't judge it in yourself. You shouldn't judge it in anybody else. Who are, I mean, who are we to really say who's saved and who isn't saved, Paul? You see the problem? And yet that's exactly what these modern, wicked, false professing Christians do. Oh, Denlinger's a lordship salvation heretic. He's crazy. He's this, he's that, because he judges sin. And he says, after I mean, after a while, I put up with a lot of stuff from people, but after a while I'm seeing this and this and that and that and that, and I'm going, 
did this person really get saved? And why am I saying that? So I can go, ha, kill them and send them to hell. No, I'm not doing that. I'm saying, make sure that you're saved. All right? If you got a whole lot of sin in your life, when Jesus Christ is saying, go and sin no more, Paul's saying, sin not. All right? There needs to be some conviction of sin there. There needs to be some, boy, I probably ought to get this out of my life. It's really negative. It's really hurting me. But you see, that's not what lost people want because they just want to have no conscience at all. They just want to go through life. If I feel like doing this, I'll do that. If I feel like saying that, I'll say it. If I feel like drinking this, I'll drink it. If I feel like, whatever. They don't want a preacher, a man of righteousness, preaching and saying, what you're doing is wrong. Stop it. They don't want that. I just want to continue doing my thing and not have to live this life of constantly going back and forth. Let me tell you something. The Christian life is not an easy life. I'll tell you that right now. Jesus Christ was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Paul, continual sorrow in his heart. Despised, rejected, suffering. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Do you think this was a fun thing that Paul's going through there in his life? Do you think he's walking around going, oh, all right, well, let's see what I need to do today. I got to go preach that thing there. And, and th I wonder if I could go over and, but you know, there's some fishing over there. And I, you know, I like that boat over there or something or, you know, whatever it was that Paul struggled with. We don't really know from the passage here. He's just saying the thing it's evil and the thing he hates, that he's doing that. You know, how many times have you done that? How many times have you try to study the Word of God and you end up watching a bunch of stupid videos on YouTube or wasting your time and, and you go and you wanted to witness to somebody and you end up talking and you never do get around to talking about the Bible or whatever else and you're just kicking yourself. And yeah, that's what a Christian lives like. That's Romans chapter 7. All right? How many times have you tried to work for the Lord and you fail? Yeah. But see... Lost people, well, they want to come along and they want to have the, I'm going to go to heaven. They get the little, I'm going to go to heaven card. I'm going to heaven because I believe in Jesus. But uh, I don't want that life of this is wrong and that's wrong and that Lord just convicted me about that and I should probably get that out of my life and and, and I'm doing good over here and all of a sudden, oh, I fail over there. And, oh, you know, and pretty soon you're just going, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You know, one of the big reasons why so many people have gone post-trib? Because they can't stand the thought of leaving the life that they love. That's why. I don't want to leave this earth. I want to stay here. And you'll start saying, I don't think the tribulation is going to be that bad. I don't think it's going to be as bad as many of the pre-tribbers make it out to be. <laughs> you know, you're a, a pre-tribber, and I, I don't really use that thing. I say you're being called up before the time of Jacob's trouble, but let's stick with the thing here. You're a pre-tribber, you're just saying, oh, you know, I remember I heard somebody say, do you ever have, you know, one of those days where it's one of those, I wish it were the rapture day days? Yeah. And, you know, you're just walking around and you're just going, oh, man. You know, right now I got a massively bad headache, you know, and I do, I'm not just saying that, you know, and 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 I got so much work to do and, and things and it's, it's snowing outside and I'm going, oh, nuts, I didn't get this done and I didn't get that done and whatever. And, you know, there's so many times you just look and you say, can we go now, Lord? Can we please go now? <laughs> you know, I just, I'm so tired of this. I'm so tired of struggling with sin. And and I'm thankful, Lord, to thank you for convicting me about all these different things and help me to clean that stuff up and get it out of my life. Thank you, Lord. I appreciate that. But I'm sorry. I sure am sorry I messed up over here and I messed up over there and whatever else. See, I'm not sinning anymore in a bunch of different areas. God's helped me to really clean up my life. I'm not the same man that I once was. Praise the Lord. All glory goes to Jesus Christ for what he's done in my life, how he's changed me. All right? Praise the Lord. Well, then you're sinless, right, Brian? Wrong. I'm not sinless, and I never will be. And I get a couple things cleaned up over here, and my flesh comes in over here and catches me off guard. Every day it's war and fighting with the flesh. The spirit and the soul say, read the word. You got some sermon notes to take care of. You need to do this. You need to do that. Do this stuff for the Lord. Hey, why don't you go talk to that person about Jesus Christ and whatever. And the flesh says, um, why don't we sleep in? Uh, why don't we 
don't eat the good food there. Just eat some sugary junk and whatever else because it tastes good. You know, let's go to the store and let's buy some junk food and whatever else. And, you know, and I'm not, and, and people go, well, oh, you're saying eating junk food sends you to hell. You can believe whatever you want to believe, all right? <laughs> Just go away, watch other videos. You know, I never said that, all right? I love people, therefore I preach against sin. I'm not preaching because I'm sinlessly perfect and I've arrived and achieved this sinless perfection state where I just kind of float on a cloud and hover around town or something. I mean, no, it doesn't work that way. But as a Christian, we continually have to be waging war against sin. And the war, the worst war that you're going to fight, brethren, is with yourself. Romans chapter 7. Your soul and your spirit are saying, I don't want to sin anymore. Every time I sin, it's negative. It puts me out of fellowship with the Lord, and I have to come back and confess that and say, I'm sorry, Lord, I'm sorry. I did something really stupid there, and, and you know, I'm being double-minded. And I'm, you, know, you want to get back in fellowship with the Lord. You're not trying to get re-saved or something like that. No, you're not losing your salvation as a Christian, but you're saying, I'm out of fellowship with the Lord. Again, a lot of times I'll say, if you're doing such and such, you're not right with God. People go, oh, then he's saying I'm going to hell. I didn't say that. All right? You can be going to heaven and not right with God in the sense of out of fellowship with him. All right? I can be married to my wife, all right, and yet not in good fellowship with her. I do something stupid or say something stupid to her. Or we get in a bad argument. I'm still married, but we're not really having good fellowship anymore, you see. Well, I'm betrothed to Jesus Christ. And I need to stay in good fellowship with my Lord and Savior. And sin gets me out of fellowship. Unconfessed sin gets me out of fellowship with Jesus Christ. So you say, well, just, just don't worry about it. It's all paid for. It's all taken care of. Then what is Paul doing in Romans chapter 7? Worrying about it. Worrying about his, his relationship there with the Lord. Well, I'm a Christian and I don't have any convictions of sin. Um, then you're not saved. I can firmly say that. If you have no conviction about sin in your life, you're not saved. That is one I can definitely say, for sure. <laughs> I mean, there's some things I can't judge. You know, I get people, I'm looking at usernames, you know. And even when I was back going to these church buildings and things like that, I'd get people and they'd come up to me and they'd talk to me about stuff and whatever else and, and uh, you know, I'd find out they're hypocrites and fake and whatever else. So don't give me this thing of, well, you need to have real fellowship, which is offline in a church building someplace. And that's, that's real and people are real there. Nonsense. Absolute total nonsense. People can fake you out wherever you're at. Doesn't matter. But, you know, one thing I can say for sure is if you have no conviction about sin of any kind and you don't worry about sin and you don't worry about getting out of fellowship with the Lord, then you're not saved. All right? I mean, why'd you come to Jesus Christ for salvation? So you could just have your little get, get to heaven card when you die and say, I want to get to heaven, but I'm not going to give up any of my sins. I'm not going to have anybody telling me how to live my life. Well, then God didn't purchase you. Your life is not your own. You're bought with a price. God has every right to come into your life and into your business when he saves you, when he buys you, when he purchases you. In other words, he has every right to come into your life and say, that needs to go. Sin no more. You need to quit that thing, son, daughter. Why? It's hurting you. If I see my little boy doing something, I see him, he's going to do something, I know it's going to hurt him, I'm not going to say... Well, that's up to him. I don't care what he does. What kind of a father would be like that? That would just simply say, I don't really care what my child does. Just, you know, you just do whatever you feel like doing. What if it feels good, do it. Whatever. Uh, that's not true salvation. True salvation is coming along and the Lord says, Hey, you're sinning. Stop. I mean, Lord tells this man and this woman both, hey, sin no more. Stop your sinning. Um, that means that he was expecting them to live sinlessly perfect? Of course not. But he was rebuking certain sins that they were doing and saying, you need to quit that. And that's what the Lord will do for you when you're saved. 
and you'll go through it. You'll you'll go through this thing. The Lord will start to put convictions in your mind, and He'll start to say, "Hey, you know what? That thing you're doing there needs to go." And one of my jobs as a preacher is, I have to bring that stuff out. I have to go through the scriptures, and I have to see what the Apostle Paul is saying, and see what the rest of the Scripture teaches, and say. If this thing is called a sin in Scripture, then I have to preach against it, no matter how unpopular it makes me. But you just want that sin, don't you? I want to keep my sin, Brian. I want to keep some sin here in my life that uh, I don't want anybody telling me, speaking against. I don't want anybody telling me it's wrong. Uh, I'm just going to say that I believe in Jesus, and that's all it takes. And I can just live my life and just, uh, you know, do whatever I feel like doing. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. <laughs> then you believed in vain. Because you don't understand what salvation is. So that is going to be it. And I uh, just want to do a couple of quick little sermons here. And uh, thank you to all those, again, that pray for the ministry. As I always say, it's very important. And um, we'll see you in the next video.